Brother Ron, and welcome to We All Be News Radio and TV, the news free Dixie for the 21st century. We coming on, coming on, coming on, coming on, coming on, coming on, coming on. Hallelujah. We got another in the house. Great, 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 great master. Mastermind. You know, I, I've, I've met so many men. It's like, it reminds me of my brother here at this very house that we're in. I know that Campbell, Tinsley, Stanley Campbell. And also uh, Ronald Hurd, which is another master historian that uh, we just love to have him pour into us. That we heard his mother earlier, so we get to hear another branch. All right, let's give him a hand and he's going to run her. Please, let's let go. Uh, give yourselves a round of applause once again. They right. put me right behind this beautiful brother right here. I don't know if I can compete with that. Uh, I'll do what I can. Thank you. I work, baby. I work. <laughs> I work. There you go, my brother. Thank you so much. I'm, just, I'm honored to be here. Uh, this is a great occasion. This wonderful, beautiful human being. Uh, today is actually the birthday of Duke Ellington. And the highest compliment he could pay a person is to say, you are beyond category. And what I can tell from my cousin Taylor, she is truly beyond category. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> so with that said, uh, her journey is just beginning. I don't look at this necessarily as a passing of a torch from my end. I'm working up to the relay team. You know what I'm saying? I haven't ran my route yet. <laughs> I'm not through yet. <laughs> so I'll be helping you. I'm your teammate. But there's some other people here that might, you know, feel like they want to pass the torch. And it is so important that when we talk about history for our people, it's not about a great man's history. It's, the, it's not a people's history, but it's a communal history. It's the history of the village. It's the history of the village healing us. I just came back from uh, Montgomery, Alabama. You know, I spent... I ain't gonna tell you how fast I was going by and get a ticket, but I made sure I was here today, even though I was late. But I went to pay my homage to the ancestors. The, the lynching museum opened up. I call it the lynching museum or the lynching memorial. According to the Tuskegee Institute, over 4,000 black folks were lynched between the start of Reconstruction after the Civil War all the way up until the middle of the century. I would say still killing us systemically. You don't have to hang a person to lynch a person. That's right. You can destroy a person's uh, knowledge of self, their identity, their, their self-worth and self-confidence. It's a thing called menticide. Where like Malcolm X said, the ancestor Malcolm X said, we still ain't hearing Malcolm. But Malcolm told us that only a fool will let their enemy be the primary educator of their children. So when I hear black folks talking about, why they don't learn that in school? Because they're supposed to learn that from you, fool. You're the first teacher of your child. You know, you learn who you are at home. You don't learn it at school. You learn reading, writing, and arithmetic or how to take a tea cap at school. You don't learn who you are and what you can be, where you come from, and your truest potential. You get that from your family, the roots of the tree. A people without uh, a knowledge or a history is like a tree without roots, what Brother Marcus Garvey said. And Brother Marcus Garvey also prophesied that the modern life will be the death of the Negro. Wow. Fast paced, overwhelmed, everything hitting you from front to back, back and forth. Well, we got to understand uh, somebody may mention of North Memphis. Memphis is a very powerful place. Yes, sir. Next year is the bicentennial of the founding of Memphis. One of the people that founded Memphis was Andrew Jackson, uh, the, the, the white dude, I ain't going to say the other word, the white dude on $20 bill. 
who has a mansion up in Nashville called the Hermitage, right? He was a slave owner. If Nathan Bedford Forrest was a president, he'd be on a dollar bill too. Just like Andrew Jackson and all the other slave owners. But what I'm saying is, they knew what Memphis was, because what was Memphis back in Egypt? You know what I'm saying? Because I hear so-called woke folks, I scare so many woke folks around here and around the country, they go back to sleep. They don't want to mess with me. Because when, when people say that Memphis is the land of the dead, no, Memphis is the land of the master teachers. Just like in ancient Egypt, Memphis is the land of the master teachers. America could not be America without Memphis. Memphis is the cultural her, her, I mean, hub of America. This is the distribution hub of the country. Our economics in this country run through Memphis. Up the river, through the railroad tracks, on the highways and byways. What I'm trying to say is, who are we? We the master teachers. We, know, we just got through celebrating Dr. King. Uh, the 50th anniversary of his crucifixion in Memphis. Right. For every crucifixion, there's a resurrection. That's Dr. King understood and overstood who Memphis was before we did. It was no coincidence. Six years ago, Memphis was up right up there with Dallas, right. Atlanta, yeah. Nashville. Now all these places have surpassed Memphis, right. but they don't got that special sauce that we got. On, Black folks are the vibranium. We the vibranium. Yes. We the secret recipe, yeah, yeah, the Colonel yeah. Center. We the vibranium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We the secret re recipe that makes this country great. Yes. It could have been great if they treated us better. But we got to treat ourselves better Man. so we could do better. When I said Dr. King knew what Memphis was, a lot of people would assume that Dr. King's favorite singer is who? Let's take an educated guess. Who do you think is Dr. King's favorite singer? That would be wrong. She was one of his greatest supporters. He, he loved her as an artist. He said a voice like that comes every once in a millennium. But his favorite singer was a black dude from Memphis named J. Robert Bradley, who was discovered and mentored by Lucy Campbell, the mother of gospel music who taught school at Booker T. Washington for decades. She was also the mentor. I call Jagna, or whatever you want to call her. Mentor got a little shaky history. Y'all can look that up. Take a look. It's all online. I ain't going to get into that too right now. Well, let's say Jagna, let's say a master teacher elder, she also discovered Mary Anderson. She debuted Mary Anderson at the National Baptist Convention where she was the director of music from 1916 to 62. So she uh, mentored Mary Anderson, Mahalia Jackson, discovered Dr. King's favorite singer, J. Robert Bradley, a Memphian from here, who died maybe 10 years ago in Nashville. That was his favorite singer. The last person he talked to on the planet was who? Dr. Ben Branch, a musician from Memphis. He was the band director for Jesse Jackson's Operation Breadbasket Band. He wanted him to play his favorite song, Precious Lord. And they shot him. And the thing about Dr. King knew who, who, who Memphis was, who Memphians were. And while I want to say like North Memphis, we don't understand, like I'm in my second year of the Jimmy Lawrence for Jim Marie Festival. It's a full week celebrating Jimmy Lawrence, who was the father of really Memphis music education in my book. He, had, he was the first high school band director. He didn't start music programs in the school. Let's talk about G.P. Hamilton. How many people know who G.P. Hamilton was? That's the problem. A lot of people with the Hamilton High School don't even know who G.P. Hamilton was. Master teacher. What I'm saying is Jimmy Lunch was the first high school band director, and um, he started at Manassas High School. He started as a volunteer. He was hired to be a, a, a football, baseball, basketball coach, math teacher, history teacher, Spanish teacher, English, anything but a musician and a music teacher, but he knew that music could empower black lives. He knew that black lives mattered back in the 1920s North Memphis. So he took his best high school students and formed, according to his peers, the greatest swing band of all time during the 30s and 40s. They were the number one attraction at the, college, uh, at the Apollo Theater for a whole decade. There was the house band at the Cotton Club at the Duke Ellington and Cab Calloway. He was the number one band of choice among black people in America. He was more popular among black folks than Duke Ellington, Cab Calloway, and Count Basin. And the thing I love about Jimmy Lonsford, he had a very giving spirit. No matter where he went in the world, he loved his people. He would always start music programs to help keep black kids out of trouble. When he came back to Memphis, he would sell out church auditorium. We would always do free musician workshops and concerts at Manassas High School. The Manassas Rhythm Bone, like Mr. Emerson Abel Jr., who was a mentor to somebody like Isaac Hayes, who went to Manassas. Or you got uh, sister Barbara Cooper, who was a rhythm bomber back in the day. So all this hidden history that needs to be known now because we need people like sister Taylor to be encouraged on her, or on her journey because Jimmy Lonsford knew the value of the village. He depended on the people in North Memphis, New Chicago to raise that money for those instruments to pay, help pay for the band. And there's still community pride in that. But what I'm saying is Jimmy Lonsford also owned and flew his own airplanes. They wasn't teaching black folks how to fly airplanes. They taught the, the Japanese dude who playing Pearl Harbor how to fly. He went to Harvard University, Yamamoto. 
But they wouldn't teach black folks how to fly airplanes back in the 30s and the 20s. Jimmy Lunsford took his first private lessons in 1939. By 1940, he brought his first plane to $20,000 during the Great Depression. He owned three planes. He used to fly to his own gig sometimes. But he died in July of 1947. He was up in Oregon. Oregon is the only state in the whole country that had in the state's constitution that black folks cannot live and work there. The only state. That's Oregon. That's up in the Pacific Northwest. And to this day, it's hardly any black folks in Oregon. I went to Portland last week. Last year, I only saw maybe 20 black folks in Portland. And that's a big city. But anyway, Jimmy Lawson went up there to Seaside, Oregon for a gig. He wanted to eat at a restaurant, get hamburgers for his group. Uh, my understanding the waiters didn't want to serve Jimmy Lawson because allegedly they were black. Jimmy Lawson demanded that they be served. Instead of uh, hamburgers, they got beef sandwiches. And right before his gig, he was signing autographs at a music shop and dropped dead at 45. So he's been buried. He's been dead since uh, July 12, 1947. He's buried in Elmwood. And he's been forgotten about. But back in this time, he was revered because he chose to be with his people. He chose to invest in black folks because before he died, like I said, Jimmy believed in the village concept. He wanted to find real estate to start a retirement community for black musicians. So he was thinking about the young people and also the elders. So that's what we got to do. That's the village concept. So now we got to resurrect, resurrect that mindset. So this year, the Jimmy Lawson Festival will be September 9th through the 16th. We are going to bring the mother of the motherships, the Sun Ra Orchestra, to Memphis. I don't know y'all know who Sun Ra was, but Sun Ra was doing stuff that Parliament, Funkadelic, you could think of anybody, Sly and the Family Stone, uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire. He was doing this stuff back in the 40s. He was already doing that. He was using synthesizers and everything. He's the mother or father of them all. And so they haven't been back since Sun Ra been, went to the next level. I guess on the mothership again. I think he died in 93. But we're resurrecting the orchestra. They're coming back. They were Wakanda before there was a Wakanda. So we're going to resurrect the village here. Memphis is the, is the spear point of the vanguard. And we got support sisters like Sister Taylor and her mission doing her God work. We got to come with the village. It's not good enough to own a business if you can't protect your interests. American history is a gangster rap album. American history is a gangster rap album. You must protect your interests. So it was good. I'm going to wrap it up. I'm not going to talk about anything. I'm going to wrap it up. I went to Montgomery because the ancestors wanted me to go to get a message. I didn't know why I had to go this weekend. I wasn't planning to go on it, but I had to act like I'm an ancestor whisperer. Dead folks be talking to me. But the ancestors are never dead. They're right in this room with us right now. Amen. And they demand justice. They are demanding reparations. But the thing about it is, Dr. King did not fall out the sky and say, I'm going to lead the black people. Dr. King went to Montgomery. The black folks said, we're going to make you our leader. The village said, we're going to invest in you, Dr. King, give you the resources, give you the support to be our leader. Yes. We are a village of leaders. You can't do this by yourself. Dr. King had to be encouraged. He didn't know who he was yet. The right woman was at the right place at the right time. Coretta gave him that vision. That black woman resurrected him like Osiris. She gave him his legacy. Her birthday was just not too long ago, maybe yesterday or the day before. But what I'm saying is the real trinity is the black man, woman, and child. That's the holy trinity. It's not no holy ghost or no white dude and a white boy. It's the black man, woman, and child. Montgomery proved it. When the black man saw the value in his black woman and wanted to protect his black family, that's when things started getting changed. That's when paradise shifts shift started to happen. Black folks have been in Uber doing the Montgomery bus boycotts. They're watching other people. Because you got to understand, you have black folks saying, we ain't going to ride the bus for 381 straight days. Brought the city to its knees. And what y'all don't understand, I, I always repeat this, the Montgomery bus boycott was more than about riding a bus. It's about protecting black women from getting raped by bus drivers and white police officers and taxi cab drivers. Because right before that, in September 3rd, 1944, you had the gang rape of Reese Taylor. Reese Taylor was a black woman in her early 20s, a young mother who was gang raped by six white men coming home from church in Alabama. And Rosa Parks was sent from Montgomery to investigate that for the NACP. And you had black people, black men coming home from World War II and Korea and say enough is enough. Yeah. If we could die and bleed for the white man to protect his interests abroad, we got to start protecting our families at home. Yes, yes, yes. And that's what that was about. It was about black men reclaiming their manhood to protect their womanhood, to help their family. But like Magic Johnson said, we lost our way. Mm. We lost our way. This is a self-pronoun. 
generation. It's got to be about we, not about I or you. Yes. It's all of us. Yes. It's not one and done. It's all of us. Because the thing, Magic Johnson said this 10 years ago in Memphis during the Freedom Awards. He said, look, today we have more millionaires than we had in 1960. But back then we had more black businesses. Yeah. And black businesses was the backbone along with the church, along with the black woman that helped lead this movement, along with unions. We had union organizing. People don't understand. I'm going to shut up now. We always talk about the 1960s being the greatest. The 1960s had nothing on the 1930s. I'm going to tell you why. The 1930s, people were very woke. You had a person like Senator Huey Long. I know y'all probably, some of y'all never heard of Huey Long, right? Y'all heard of Huey Newton, right? right. Huey Newton is named after Huey Long. Huey, Long, Huey Newton was from Monroe, Louisiana. Huey, Huey Long was a white dude from Louisiana who was the governor of Louisiana and became a U.S. senator. But he didn't, he was different from a George Wallace. He didn't try to use race to divide people. He used the class and living wage issue to unite people. He said that everybody deserves a living wage. And the reason why Huey Newton is named after him is because at one point, Louisiana had one of the highest adult illiteracy rates in the country. Huey Long started a program where he wanted to cut down on adult literacy. He did not discriminate in who got the help. So a lot of black folks in Louisiana were helped by him you know, providing a service to help them learn how to read. So that's why Huey Newton is named after Huey Long. This guy had a thing called share the wealth. Because like right now what they're talking about is fight for 15. You should be getting $30 an hour. The fight for 15 is a joke, but it's the dumbification of America that you don't know this history. It should be $30 an hour for minimum wage. And there was fight for a living wage back then. He had a group called share the wealth that had 12 million members back in the 1930s nationwide. 12 million members. He had radio reach of 25 million people on the average. And he was talking about Everybody deserve a living wage. Dr. King echoed the same sentiments in the 1960s. They both got killed when they started talking about the economic situation in America. Right. They were not killed because we talking about integration, about voting. They got killed because they wanted to share the wealth. That's, right. That's going to kill us all if we don't understand what's going on. Our leadership has sold us down the river. They have made diversity the issue when wiping us out is the agenda. Phasing us out is the agenda. It's not that diversity is a kill pill. We are the majority, and you got yourself thinking you're the minority. They got you, you the greatest, and they got you thinking like you're a chump. The power of words create worlds. So I want us to understand it's time for us to reclaim the power of words create worlds. It's time for us to reclaim the narrative. It's time for us to give people like Sister Cousin Taylor something to fight for. Because really, the only thing you want to change anything, they'll be willing to die for what you want. Right. You don't have to go to school for it. You don't have to be no karate master. You don't have to be the, the richest person in the world or the smartest person in the world. Let be willing to die for what you want. Dr. King said, if a man ain't willing to die for anything, he ain't fit to live. That's right. So be willing to die for what you want and be willing to not only die for what you want, but live and fight for what you want. Fight and protect your interests. Protect yourself. Protect your mind. It's not about all this because they could knock down projects in Section 8 housing, but if they didn't change your mind or reboot your mind, everywhere you look, it's a ghetto. Everywhere you look is the projects. You are prosperous. Don't let their limited imagination and expectation of what you could be limit you in your mind. You create your world. You create your reality. Amen. Imagination is more powerful than knowledge. Even Einstein overstood that. So I want you to say, you got a chance. I had uh, went to a funeral. I'm going to shut up. I promise. I went to a funeral of a guy who just turned 30 years old. 25 days later, he committed suicide. I met this young man. I wish I had, could talk to him one last time. I was always impressed with him, the way he knew so much about certain things. He was well-versed and well-read in the Bible, very respected of people. He was a, a really a healer. He was the one that visited the sick and the shut-in. But you never know what nobody's going through. The, the, the person that's the most cheerful person in the room could be the saddest person in the room. You don't know what nobody's going through. So it's good just to check in with yourself. But he just, you know... He said his goodbyes and checked out. But he didn't know how much of an inspiration he was. I talked to people that witnessed his works in his front and his home going. So I want, I want to tell y'all that you are more vibrant than you know. That you are the vibranium that you see. That you are the director, the screenwriter, the lead actor, and the executive producer of your movie, which is your life. You could choose it to be a dramedy or a comedy or a horror movie. But don't let something, what well, Baba Dick Gregory used to tell me, don't let something that happened to you at four years old be the whole narrative of your life. 
Don't let something that happened to you when you just got started be the whole narrative of them in your life. You got the power. And it's now is your time. She's the moment. God bless you. In the words of Duke Elton's cousin Taylor, we love you madly. Shut up now. I'm through. <laughs>